everyone, this is Jared Rand, and welcome to the Global Guided Meditation Call for Monday, October 10th, 2022, unless it's 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll be having a Time for Change call this Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Your actual self is not a separate and lonely part of this world. But the real you is the world itself. Everything that there is expressing itself as this particular organism here and now. We are all pits on the same sow and rays from the same sun, Ellen Watts. A lot of us get, uh, we get on ourselves or we can, you know, come down heavy on ourselves at times. I learned a long time ago that this doesn't work at all. It's very heavy and it's pulling. And Self-forgiveness carries a powerful energy that can completely transform your being and your life. Forgiving yourself is all about clearing away the weight of your past that you have been carrying inside your heart. When your heart is liberated, it creates a space for you to receive love again. As forgiveness floods your being, you will naturally feel more joyful, peaceful, and empowered to manifest what you truly desire. The more deeply you forgive yourself, the lighter and higher your vibration will grow. And the easier it will be to manifest anything your imagination can dream. To forgive is the highest, most beautiful form of love. In return, you will receive untold peace and happiness. Robert Mueller. Forgiving yourself is one of the most beautiful gifts you can give yourself. When you forgive yourself for something you have done or regretted doing in the past, you're sending a warm blanket of gentle love all throughout your being. You're letting in an all-encompassing healing energy that takes over you completely. You are loving yourself deeply and eternally, even though you may have done something that your ego judges is wrong. The truth is that whenever you are striving to be that perfect being, it just implies that you're not there yet. Your true essence is already divine. You already are a child of the God source and will always be there. Everything you have done in the past has been guided by this infinite divine presence that you are. So you are perfection itself, which requires no effort to maintain it all. Therefore, forgiving yourself is simply honoring the divine being that you are now and accepting every part of you that appears to be unlovable. There is only one species of forgiveness, self-forgiveness, no one Every one of us deserves to be liberated from all pain. We have the ability to let go of any self-judgment or self-abuse that keeps resurfacing from deep inside. All self-defeating feelings and thoughts just lower our vibrational field and keep us stuck in constantly pushing ourselves. To stop this pattern, simply notice those thoughts and feelings that free you. Whatever you focus on grows. So pay attention to the thoughts that open your heart and allow you to feel expansive. The more you practice this, the easier it becomes to naturally feel loved, liberated, and truly at peace. So pause at that moment. You find yourself sending negative energy towards yourself and choose to practice gentleness and acceptance instead. You'll start to soften and be open to being able to know 
this divine being that you are. Self-forgiveness is essential to self-healing. Ruth Carter Stapleton. It's always good to write down everything that you did in the past that your heart still feels heavy about or is still holding on to you, including everything you can think of. Make it a very extensive and exhaustive list. Include any judgments from others that you have taken on and feel heaven heavy even thinking about it. If you're feeling someone's judgment of you, then you are letting in judgmental negative energy. This is an opportunity to forgive yourself for doing so. Write down anything that makes your heart heavy in any way. Have an inner dialogue with your wounded self. Take the first item on your list. Imagine you are meeting with that wounded part in a special healing room. Picture this old wounded you is sitting right across from you. And then ask what they would most like to heal. Let your wounded self respond. Allow this part of you to express everything it needs to say. Continue dialoguing with this part until it has released all of the negativity that you have held for years. Continue listening until it feels complete. Then let this wounded self know that it is loved deeply and has always been loved. Allow the energy from the healing room to suffuse the cells of this old part. Support this part by remaining curious about why it acted the way it did. Then forgive your wounded self by saying something out loud like, I forgive you completely for everything that you did. I understand why you did it and realize that you just didn't have the wisdom I do now. I will always love you. Once you experience this dialogue, you will naturally feel differently about this past event. Then go through each item on your forgiveness list until you have freed every part from the burden it was carrying. Practice forgiving others. Self-forgiveness comes naturally into your heart the more accepting you are with others. As you make peace with other people's issues, the energies of compassion and empathy grow within yourself and for yourself. Those are around you, those around you, who are still carrying burdens from their past will feel lighter in your presence each time they see you. They will remember your level of acceptance and forgiveness, which again allows you to feel lighter about you. And as you practice forgiving those closest to you, you'll find you are creating a more peaceful world everywhere you go. In a short while, all you'll see is a world filled with lightness. You create that. You can create anything you desire. It doesn't have to be material all the time. It could be anything. It can be emotional. But you can literally manifest it. And as you do that, you change your surroundings. They go through a metamorphosis. The more you focus on certain things, the more those certain things will become relevant in your face, appear, Our capacity to make peace with another person and with this world depends very much on our capacity to make peace with ourselves. The storm outside of us is an illusion. And I know that's for that's real tough for some people to comprehend. Their minds are so small of a vessel. But the storm outside of us is what we've created. The peace in the center of the storm, which is the God you are within that body. Because all the things we focus on, whatever it may be, if you, the more time you give it, the more it's going to build. The more it's going to become 
And most of the time we don't know that because we're so distracted with so many other things. All that mind chatter in us, there's a lot of it. Now, interesting, it's interesting uh, understanding because this is a massive educational shift for humanity. And we're always talking about relationships. Talk about ourselves, healing ourselves. And for instance, when you fall in love with a woman, right? watch and be alert. It may be nothing but narcissism. The woman's face and her eyes and her words. Or man, it just depends. The woman's face and her eyes and her words may be simply functioning as a lake in which you are seeing your reflection. My own observation is this. Out of 100 lovers, 99 are narcissistic. People don't love the woman that is there. They love the appreciation that the woman is giving to them, the attention that the woman is giving to them, the flattery that the woman is showering on the man, or vice versa. The woman flatters the man. The man flatters the woman. It is a mutual flattery. The woman says there is nobody as beautiful as you are. You are a miracle. You are the greatest that God has ever made. Even Alexander the Great was nothing compared to you. And you are puffed up and your chest becomes double. And your head starts swelling. There is nothing but straw, but it starts swelling. And you say to the woman, you're the greatest creation of God. Even Cleopatra was nothing compared to you. I can't believe that God will ever be able to improve upon you. There will never again be another woman so beautiful. This is what you call love. This is narcissism. The man becomes the pool of water and reflects the woman. And the woman becomes the pool of water and reflects the man. In fact, the pool not only reflects the truth, but dis dis decorates it in a thousand and one ways and makes it look more and more beautiful. This is what people call love. Naturally, we, you, you have this body, this being. You are rooted in it. Enjoy it. Cherish it. Celebrate it. And there is no question of pride or ego because you are not comparing yourself with anybody. Ego comes only with comparison. Self-love knows no comparison. You are you. That's all. You are not saying that somebody else is inferior to you. You are not comparing at all. Whenever comparison comes, know well it is not love. It is a trick somewhere. A subtle strategy of the ego. Ego lives through comparison. When you say to a woman, I love you, it is one thing. When you say to a woman, Cleopatra was nothing compared to you, it is another. Totally another. Just the opposite. Why bring Cleopatra in? Can't you love this woman without bringing Cleopatra in? Cleopatra is, is brought in to puff the ego. Love this man. Why bring in Alexander the Great? Love knows no comparison. Love simply loves without comparing. So whenever there is a comparison, remember it is egotistic pride. It is narcissism. And whenever there is no comparison, remember it is love, whether of oneself or the other. In real love, there is no division. The lovers melt into each other, in egotistic love, there is great division. The division of the lover and the love. The real love, there is no relationship. The real love. In real love, there is no relationship because there are two persons to be related to. In real love, there is only love. A flowering, a fragrance, a melting, a merging. Only in egotistic love are there two persons, the lover and the loved. 
And whenever there is that lover and the loved, love disappears. Whenever there is love, the lover and the beloved both disappear into love. Love is such a great phenomenon, you cannot survive in it. Real love is always in the present. Egotistic love is always either in the past or in the future. In real love, there is a passionate coolness. It will look paradoxical. But all greater realities of this life are paradoxical. Hence, they call it passionate coolness. There is warmth, but there is no heat in it. Warmth certainly is there, but there is also coolness in it, a very collected, calm, cool state. Love makes one less feverish, but if it is not real love, but egotistic love, then there is a great heat. Then the passion is there like fever. There is no coolness at all. If you can remember these things, you will have the criterion for judging. But one has to start with oneself. There is no other way. It always begins with oneself. One has to start from where one is. Love yourself. Love immensely. And in that very love, your pride, your ego, and all that nonsense, will disappear. And when it has disappeared, your love will start reaching to other people. And it will not be a relationship, but a sharing. It will not be an object, subject relationship, but a melting, a togetherness. It will not be feverish. It will be a cool passion. It will be warm and cool together. It will give you the first taste of the paradoxicalness of this life. And then some people say, why is love so painful? Love is painful because it creates the way for bliss. Love is painful because it transforms. Love is mutation. Each transformation is going to be painful because the old has to be left for the new. The old is familiar, secure, and safe. The new is absolutely unknown. You will be moving in an uncharted ocean. You cannot use your mind with the new, with the old. The mind is skillful. The mind can function only with the old. With the new, the mind is utterly useless. Remember that. The mind can function only with the old. With the new, the mind is utterly useless. Hence, fear arises. And leaving the old, comfortable, safe world, the world of convenience, Pain arises. It is the same pain that the child feels when he comes out of the womb of the mother. It is the same pain that the bird feels when he comes out of the egg. It is the same pain that the bird will feel when he will try for the first time to be on the wing. The fear of the unknown And the security of the known, the insecurity of the unknown, and the unpredictability of the unknown makes one very much frightened. And because the transformation is going to be from the self toward a state of no self, agony is very deep. But you cannot have ecstasy without going through agony. If the gold wants to be purified, it has to pass through the fire. Love is fire. 
It is because of the pain of love that millions of people live a loveless life. It is because of the pain of love that millions on this planet of people live a loveless life. They too suffer, and then their suffering is futile. To suffer in love is not to suffer in vain. To suffer in love is creative. It takes you to higher levels of consciousness. To suffer without love is utterly a waste. It leads you nowhere. It keeps you moving in the same vicious circle. The man who is without love is narcissistic. He is closed. He knows only himself. And how much can he know himself? if he has not known the other. Because only the other can function as a mirror. You will never know yourself without knowing the other. Love is very fundamental for self-knowledge also. The person who has not known the other in deep love, in intense passion, in utter ecstasy, will not be able to know who he is because he will not have the mirror to see his own reflection. Relationship is a mirror. And the purer the love is, the higher the love is. The better the mirror. The cleaner the mirror. But the higher love needs you to be open. The higher love needs you to be vulnerable. You have to drop your arm. That is painful. You have not to be constantly on guard. You have to drop the calculating mind. You have to risk. You have to live dangerously. Other, the other can hurt you. That is the fear in being vulnerable. The other can reject you. That is the fear in being in love. The reflection that you will find in the other of your own self may be ugly. That is the anxiety. Avoid the mirror. But by avoiding the mirror, you are not going to become beautiful. By avoiding the situation, you are not going to grow either. The challenge has to be taken. One has to go, choose to go into love. That is the first step toward God, and it cannot be bypassed. Those who try to bypass the step of love will never reach God. That is absolutely necessary because you become aware of your totality only when you are provoked by the presence of the other. When your presence is enhanced by the presence of the other, when you are brought out of your narcissistic closed world under the open sky, love is an open sky. To be in love is to be on the wing, but certainly the unbounded sky creates fear. And to drop the ego is very painful because we have been taught to cultivate the ego. Okay? And to drop the ego is very painful because we have been taught to cultivate the ego. We think the ego is our only treasure. We have been protecting it. We have been decorating it. We have been continuously polishing it. And when love knocks on the door, all that is needed is to fill in, fall in love, is to put aside the ego. Certainly, it is painful. It is your whole life's work. It is all that you have created. This ugly ego, this idea that I am separate from existence. 
this idea is ugly because it is untrue. This idea is illusionary. But our society exists, is based on this idea that each person is a person, not a presence. You ever thought about yourself when you walk into a group or interacting with people? And my presence is here instead of this person is here. Their presence is here. The truth is that there is no person at all in the world. The truth is, is that there is no person at all in the world. There is only presence. You are not, not as an ego, separate from the whole. You are part of the whole. The whole penetrates you. The whole breathes in you, pulsates in you. The whole is your life. Love gives you the first experience of being in tune with something that is not your ego. Love gives you the first experience of being in tune with something that is not your ego. Love gives you the first lesson that you can fall into harmony with someone who has never been part of your ego. If and when you can be in harmony with a woman, if you can be in harmony with a friend, with a man, if you can be in harmony with your child or with your mother, why can't you be in harmony with all human beings? And if to be in harmony with a single person gives such joy, what will be the outcome if you are in harmony with all human beings? And if you can be in harmony with all human beings, why can't you be in harmony with animals and birds and trees. Then one step leads to another. Love is a ladder. Love is the, it starts with one person. It ends with the totality. Love is the beginning. God is the end. To be afraid of love, to be afraid of the growing pains of love, is to remain enclosed in a dark cell. Modern man is living in a dark cell. It is narcissistic. Narcissism is the greatest obsession of the modern mind. And then there are problems which are meaningless. There are problems that are creative because they lead you to higher awareness. There are problems that lead you nowhere. They simply keep you tethered. They simply keep you in your old mess. Love creates problems. You can avoid those problems by avoiding love. But those are very essential problems. They have to be faced, encountered. They have to be lived and gone through and gone beyond. And to go beyond, the way is through. Love is the only real thing worth doing. All else is secondary. If it helps love, it is good. All else is just the means. Love is the end. So whatsoever the pain, go into love. If you don't go into love, as many people have decided, then you are stuck with yourself. Then your life is not a pilgrimage. Then your life is not a river going to the ocean. Your life is a stagnant pool, dirty, and soon there will be nothing but dirt and mud. To keep clean, one needs to keep flowing. A river remains clean because it goes on flowing. Flow is the process of remaining continuously virgin. A lover remains a virgin. All lovers are virgin. The people who don't love cannot remain virgin. 
they become dormant, stagnant. They start thinking sooner or later, and sooner rather than later, because they have nowhere to go. Their life is dead. That's what modern man finds himself. And because of this, all kinds of neurosis, all kinds of madness have become rampant. Psychological illness has taken epidemic proportions on this planet. It is no longer that a few individuals are psychologically ill. The reality is the whole earth has become a madhouse. The whole of humanity is suffering from a kind of neurosis. And that neurosis is coming from your narcissistic stagnancy. Everyone is stuck with their own illusion of having a separate self. Then people go mad. And this madness is meaningless, unproductive, uncreative. Or people start committing suicide. Those suicides are also unproductive, uncreative. You may not commit suicide by taking poison or jumping from a cliff or by shooting yourself, but you can commit a suicide, which is a very slow process, and that's what happens. Very few people commit suicide suddenly. Others have decided for a slow suicide. Gradually, slowly, slowly they die. But the tendency to be suicidal has become almost universal. This is no way to live. And the reason, the fundamental reason, is that we have forgotten the language of love. We are no longer courageous enough to go into the adventure called love. Hence, people are interested in sex. Because sex is not risky. It is momentary. You don't get involved. Love is, is involvement. It is commitment. It is not momentary. Once it takes root, it can be forever. It can be a lifelong involvement. Love needs intimacy. And only when you are intimate does the other become a mirror. When you meet sexually with a woman or a man, you have not met at all. In fact, you avoided the soul of the other person. You just used the body and escaped. And the other used your body and escaped. You never became intimate enough to reveal each other's original faces. Love is the greatest Zen koan. It is painful, but don't avoid it. If you avoid it, you have avoided the greatest opportunity to grow. Go into it. Suffer love. Because through the suffering comes great ecstasy. There is agony, but out of the agony, ecstasy is born. You will have to die as an ego, but if you can die as an ego, you will be born as God, as a Buddha. And what we're saying here is that once you master your ego, ego mind, through the now and the breath, you are then God. You have discovered who and what you truly are. You are the Buddha. You're the Krishna. And love will give you the first tongue-tip taste of Tao, of Sufism, of Zen. Love will give you the first proof that life is not meaningless. The people who say life is meaningless are the people who have not known love. All that they are saying is that their life has missed love. Let there be pain. Let there be suffering. Go through the dark night, and you will reach a beautiful sunrise. It is only in the womb of the dark night that the sun evolves. It is only through the dark night that the morning comes.
our whole approach will one day will be that of love. We will teach love, only love, and nothing else. You can forget about God. That is just an empty word. You can forget about prayers because they are only rituals imposed by others on you. Love is the natural prayer, not imposed by anybody. You are born with it. Love is the true God, not the God of theologian, but the God of Buddha, Muhammad, the God of the Sufis. Love is a device a method to kill you as a separate individual and to help you become the infinite. Disappear as a dewdrop and become the ocean, but you will have to pass through the door of love. And certainly when one starts disappearing like a dewdrop and one has lived long as a dewdrop, it hurts because one has been thinking. I am this, and now this is going, I am dying. You are not dying, but only an illusion is dying. You have become identified with the illusion, true, but the illusion is still an illusion. And only when the illusion is gone will you be able to see who you are. And that revelation brings you to the ultimate peak of joy, bliss, and celebration. So people have asked me, how is it that the inscription on the Greek temple of Delphi says, know thyself and not love thyself? The Greek mind has an obsession with knowledge. The Greek mind thinks in terms of knowledge, how to know. That's why Greeks produced the greatest tradition of philosophers, thinkers, logicians, great rational minds. But the passion is to know. In the world, you may see it, that there are only two types of minds. Only two types. Greek and Hindu. The Greek mind has a passion to know, and the Hindu mind has a passion to be. The Hindu mind is not too concerned about knowing, but about being. Sat, being, is the very search, who am I? Not to know it in a logical way, but to drown in one's own existence so one can taste it, so one can be it because there is no other way to know, really. If you ask Hindus, they will say there is no other way to know than to be. How can you know love? The only way is to become a lover. Be a lover, and you will know. And if you are trying to stand outside the experience and just be an observer, then you may know about love but you will never know love. The Greek mind has produced the whole scientific growth. Modern science is a byproduct of the Greek mind. Modern science insists on being dispassionate, standing outside, watching, unprejudiced. Be objective. Be impersonal. These are the basic requirements if you want to become a scientist. Be impersonal. Don't allow your emotions to color anything. Be dispassionate, almost not interested in any hypothesis in any way. Just watch the fact. Don't get involved in it. Remain outside. Don't be a participant. This is the Greek passion, a dispassionate search for knowledge. It has helped, but it has helped only in one direction. The direction of matter, that is the way to know matter. The direction of matter is the way to know matter. 
You can never come to know consciousness that way. You can know that outside, you can never know the inside because in the inside, you are already involved. There is no way to stand outside of it. You are already there. The inside is you. How can you get out of it? I can watch a stone, rock, river, dispassionately because I am separate. How can I watch myself dispassionately? I am involved in it. I cannot be outside it. I cannot reduce myself to being an object. I will remain the subject, and I will remain the subject. Whatsoever I do, I am the knower. I am not the known. So the Greek mind shifted by and by toward matter. The motto, the inscription at Delphi's temple, know thyself became the source of the whole scientific progress. But by and by, the very idea of dispassionate knowledge led the Western mind away from its own being. The Hindu mind, the other type of mind, is the world. Has and has another direction. The direction is of being. In the Upanishad, the great matter, the Odala, says to his son and his disciple, Swetkitu, that art thou, that art thou. There is no distinction between that and thou. That is your reality. Thou is the reality. There is no distinction. There is no possibility to know it as you know a rock. There is no possibility to know it as you know other things. You can only be it. On the Temple of Delphi, of course, it was written, Know thyself. It is expresses of the Greek mind because the temple is in Greece. The inscription is Greek. If the temple had been in India, then the inscription would have been be thyself. Because that art, thou. The Hindu mind moved closer and closer to one's own being. That's why it became non-scientific. It became religions, religious, but non-scientific. It became introvert, but then it lost all moorings in the outside world. The Hindu mind became very rich inside, but the outside became very poor. A great synthesis is needed, a great synthesis between the Hindu and the Greek mind. It can be the greatest, greatest, deeply eternal loving for the earth. Up to now, it has not been possible. But now, the basic requirements are there. And the synthesis is possible. The East and the West are meeting in a very subtle way. The Eastern people are going to the West to learn science, to become scientists. And the Western seekers are moving toward the East to learn what religion is. A great mingling and merging is happening. In the future, the East is not going to be East, and the West is not going to be West. The Earth is going to become a global village, a small place, where all distinctions will disappear. And then, for the first time, the great synthesis will arise. The greatest ever which will not think in extremes, which will not think that if you go outside, if you are a searcher after knowledge, then you lose your roots in being. Or if you search in your being, you search in your being, love your roots in the world. And the scientific realm, but can be together and whenever this happens, a man has both wings. He can fly to the highest sky possible. Otherwise, you have only one wing. And as it is seen, Hindus are lopsided as much as the Greek mind is lopsided. Both are half of the reality. Religion is half. Science is half. Something has to happen to bring religion and science together and a greater whole. 
where science does not deny religion and where religion does not condemn science. How is it that the inscription on the Greek temple to Delphi says, know thyself and not love thyself? Love thyself is possible only if you become thyself. If you be thyself, otherwise it is not possible. Otherwise, the only possibility is to go on trying to know who you are, and that too from the outside, watching from the outside who you are, and that too in an objective way, not in an intuitive way. The Greek mind, you can see what influences our presence on this planet. The Greek mind developed a tremendous logical capacity. Aristotle became the father of all logic and all philosophy. The Eastern mind looks illogical because it is. The very insistence on meditation is illogical because meditation says that you can know only when the mind is dropped when thinking is dropped, you merge yourself into your being so totally that not even a single thought is there to distract you. Only then can you know. And the Greek mind says, you can know only when thinking is clear, logical, rational, systematic. The Hindu mind says, when thinking disappears completely, only then is there any possibility to know. They are totally different moving in diametrically opposite direction. But there is a possibility to synchronize both. A person can use his mind when working on matter. Then logic is a great instrument. And the same person can put aside the mind when he moves into his meditation chamber and moves into the no mind. Because mind is not you. It is an instrument, just like your hand, legs, if you want to walk, you use your legs. If you don't want to walk, you don't use your legs. Exactly in the same way. You can use the mind logically if you are trying to know about matter. It is perfectly right. It fits there. And when you are moving inward, put it aside. Now legs are not needed. Thinking is not needed. Now you need a deep, silent state of no thought. And both of these things can happen in one person. And when I say it, I say it from my own experience. I have been doing both when it is needed. I can become logical as I can become as logical as any Greek when it is not needed. I can become as absurd and illogical as any Hindu. So when I say it, I mean it, and it is not a hypothesis. I have experienced it that way. The mind can be used and can be put aside. It is an instrument, a very beautiful instrument. No need to be so obsessed with it. No need to be so fixed or fixated with it. Then it becomes a dis-ease. Just think of a man who wants to sit but cannot sit because he says, I have legs, how can I sit? Or think of a man who wants to keep quiet and silent and cannot keep quiet and silent because he says, I have a mind. It is the same. One should become so capable that even the closer and the closest instrument of mind can be put aside and can be put off. It can be done. It has been done. But it has not been done on a great scale. But more and more, it will be done. And by sharing this with all of you, this is what we're doing. When I talk to you and discuss problems with you, that's logical. That is using the mind. And then I say to you, drop the mind. Move into deep meditation. If you dance, dance so totally that there is not a single thought inside your whole energy becomes dance. 
or sing than sing or sit than just sit. Be in zazen. Don't do anything else. Don't allow a single thought to pass through. Just be quiet. Absolutely quiet. These are contradictory things. Every morning, you meditate. And every morning, you come and listen. Every morning, you listen. And then you go and meditate. This is contradictory. If you would say, if I were just Greek, I would talk to you. I would make a log- I would make logical communications to you. But then I would not say to meditate. That is foolish. If I were just Hindu, there would be no need to talk to you. I can say, just go and meditate. Because what is the point of talking? You see, this is a it's a, it's an understanding of balance. When we become both, the Greek and the Hindu minds combined, then life is very enriched, tremendously enriched. Then you don't lose anything. Then everything is absorbed. Then you become a great orchestra. Then all polarities meet in you. Now, for the Greeks, the very idea of love thyself would have been absurd because they would say, and they would say logically, that love is possible only between two persons. You can love somebody else. You can even love your enemy. But how can you love yourself? Only you are there, alone. Love can exist between a duality, a polarity. How can you love yourself? For the Greek mind, the very idea of loving oneself is absurd. For love, the other is needed. For the Hindu mind, in the Upanishad, they say that you love your wife not for your wife's sake. You love your wife just for your own sake. You love yourself through her because she gives you pleasure. That's why you love her, but deep down, you love your own pleasure. You love your son. You love your friend. Not because of them, but because of you. Deep down, your son makes you happy. Your friend gives you solace. That's what you are hankering for. So in the Upanishads, they say that you love yourself. Really. Even if you say that you love others, that is just a via media to love yourself. A long roundabout way to love yourself. And to say that there is no other possibility. You can love only yourself. And Greeks say there is no possibility to love oneself because at least two are needed. Some of us are both Hindu and Greek perspective. If you love, ask me, I will say love is a paradox. It is a very paradoxical phenomenon. Don't try to reduce it to one pole. Both polarities are needed. The other is needed to be in deep love the other disappears if you watch two lovers they are two and one together that's the paradox of love and that's the beauty of it they are two yes they are two and yet they are not two they are one if this oneness has not happened then love is not possible they may be doing something else in the name of love If they are still two and not one also, then love has not happened. And if you are just alone and there is nobody else, then two love is not possible. Love is a paradoxical phenomenon. It needs two in the first place 
and then the last place it needs to to exist as one. It is the greatest enigma. It is the greatest puzzle. How can I love better? Love is enough unto itself. It needs no betterment. It is perfect as it is. It is not in any way meant to be more perfect. The very desire shows a misunderstanding about love and its nature. Can you have a perfect circle? All circles are perfect. If they are not perfect, they are not circles. Perfection is intrinsic to a circle, and the same is the law about love. You cannot love less, and you cannot love more, because it is not a quantity. It is a quality which is immeasurable. Your very question shows that you have never tasted what love is and you are trying to hide your lovelessness and the desire of knowing how to love better. No one who knows love can ask this question. And this question is asked a lot. Love has to be understood, not as a biological infatuation. That is lust. That exists in all the animals. There is nothing special about it. It exists even in trees. It is nature's way of reproduction. There is nothing spiritual in it and nothing especially human. So the first thing is to make a clear-cut distinction between lust and love. Lust is a blind passion. Love is the fragrance of a silent, peaceful, meditated heart. Love has nothing to do with biology or chemistry or hormones. Love is the flight of your consciousness to higher realms, beyond matter and beyond body. The moment you understand love as something transcendental, then love is no longer a fundamental question. The fundamental question is how to transcend the body, how to know something within you that is beyond, beyond all that is measurable. This is the meaning of the word matter. It comes from a Sanskrit root, matra, which means measurement. It means that which can be measured. The word meter comes from the same root. The fundamental question is how to go beyond the measurable and enter into the unmeasurable. In other words, how to go beyond matter and open your eyes towards more consciousness. And there is no limit to consciousness. The more you become conscious, the more you realize how much more is possible ahead. And as you reach one peak, another peak arises in front of you. It is an eternal pilgrimage. Love is a byproduct of a rising consciousness. It is just like that fragrance of a flower. Don't search for it in the roots. It is not there. Your biology is your roots. Your consciousness is your flow, flowering. As you become more and more an open lotus of consciousness, you will be surprised, taken aback, with a tremendous experience, which can only be called love. You are so full of joy, so full of bliss, each fiber of your being is dancing with ecstasy. You are just like a rain cloud that wants to rain and shower. The moment you are overflowing with bliss, a tremendous longing arises in you to share it. That sharing is love. Love is not something that you can get from someone who has not attained to blissfulness. And this is the misery of the world the whole world. Everybody is asking to be loved and pretending to love. You cannot love because you don't know what consciousness is. You don't know that Satyam, that Shiva, that Sandra, you don't know truth. You don't know the experience of the divine. And you don't know the fragrance of beauty. What have you got to give? 
you are so empty. You are so hollow. Nothing grows in your being. Nothing is green. There are no flowers within you. Your spring has not come yet. Love is a byproduct. When the spring comes, and you suddenly start flowering and blossoming, and you release your potential fragrance, sharing that fragrance, sharing that grace, sharing that beauty is love. And the truth to you, the truth to all of us, is we don't know what love is. We can't know because we have not yet gone deeper into our consciousness. We have not experienced ourselves. We know nothing of who we are in this blindness, in this ignorance, in this unconsciousness. Love does not grow. This is a desert in which we are living, in this darkness. In this desert, there is no possibility of love blossom. First, you have to be full of light and full of delight, so full, so full that you start overflowing. That overflowing energy is love. Then love is known as the greatest perfection in the world. It is never less, and it is never more. But our very upbringing is so neurotic, so psychologically sick, that it destroys all possibilities of inner growth. We are being taught from the very beginning to be a perfectionist. And then naturally, we go on applying our perfectionist ideas to everything, even to love. I recently read a statement. Uh, A perfectionist is a person who takes great pains and gives even greater pains to others. And the outcome is just a miserable world. Everybody is trying to be perfect. And the moment somebody starts to be perfect, He or she starts expecting everybody else to be perfect. He starts condemning people. He starts humiliating humiliating people. That's what all of our so-called saints have been doing down the ages. That's what our religions have done to us, poisoned our being with an idea of perfection. Because we cannot be perfect. We are feeling guilty. We lose respect for ourselves. And the man who has lost respect for himself has lost all the dignity of being human. Our pride has been crushed. Our humanity has been destroyed by beautiful words like perfection. Man cannot be perfect. Yes, there is something that man can experience, but which is beyond the ordinary conception of man. Unless man also experiences something of the divine, he cannot know perfection. Perfection is not something like a discipline. It is not something that you can practice. It is not something for which you have to go through rehearsals, but that it is what is being taught to the body. And the result is a world full of hypocrites who know perfectly well that they are hollow and empty, but they go on pretending all kinds of qualities that are nothing but empty words. When you say to someone, I love you, have you ever thought what you mean? It is just biological infatuation between the two sexes. Then once you have satisfied your animal appetite, all so-called love will disappear. It was just a hunger, and you have fulfilled your hunger, and you are finished. The same woman who was looking the most beautiful in the world and the same man who was looking like Alexander the Great, you start thinking how to get rid of this fellow. It will be very enlightening to understand this letter written by Potty to his beloved Maureen. My darling Maureen, I would climb the highest mountain for your sake. I'd swim the wildest sea. I would endure any hardships to spend a moment by your side. Your ever-loving Patty. P.S. I'll be over to see you on Friday night if it is not raining. The moment you say to someone, I love you, you don't know what you are saying. You don't know what it is, just lust hiding behind a beautiful word, love. It will disappear. It is very momentary. 
Love is something eternal. It is the experience of the Buddhas, not the unconscious people. The whole world is full of it. Only very few people have known what love is. And these same people are the most awakened, the most enlightened, the highest peaks of human consciousness. If you really want to know love, forget about love and remember meditation. If you want to bring roses into your garden, forget about roses and take care of the rose bush. Give nourishment to it, water it. Take care that it gets the right amount of sun and water. If everything is taken care of in the right time, the roses are destined to come. You cannot bring them earlier. You cannot force them to open up sooner. And you cannot ask a rose to be more perfect. I'll join you in meditation, and I'll return to close the settlement.
take an easy and a slow breath in through the nose and an easy and slow breath out of the mouth. Be still. Your mind will most likely get crazier the more you meditate. This is an illusion. You are simply becoming more aware of the chaos that is already present in you. If you cannot stand the amount of mind chatter, take a few minutes before you sit to relax your body. Start by imagining a warm, relaxing light going into your toes and moving all the way up your body. Take this with you for the rest of the day into the evening and night the following morning. We will return here Tuesday. October 11th, 2022, 3 p.m. Eastern, to continue our global guided meditation home.